right. Good afternoon, ladies. My name is Jenny Kitching, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to lunch today. Um, we are going to be celebrating successful women. Before I introduce you to our guest panelists today, I just want to attend to some housekeeping. So the session will be recorded. Um, we will be running three polls during the session. So the first one is already up. If you wouldn't mind, please completing that poll and submitting your answers. Um, we'd like the session, sorry, there's a slide at the moment on the screen. So if you can't find the poll, uh, click on the three little dots, polling option, option will come up and then you'll be able to see the poll. Uh, we'd like the session to be as interactive as possible. So we've already received some questions with the registration. So thank you to those people who have send questions through already. Uh, please keep your questions coming. Please make sure that when you uh, submit a question, you select all panelists. If you select the host, then we won't be able to see your question. So please, um, in the in the Q&A section, select all panelists and submit your question to the panel. Andrew's got a slide to show you how to do that. So exactly like the polling, but to the left of the polling thing is Q&A and you choose the Q&A option. Then you can also change uh, your screen settings. So if you want to change your view, you, if you don't learn like the way your screen currently looks, uh, the slide that is up now will show you how you can change your view um, to be more comfortable. Right, so that's the, house, the housekeeping. Gives me great pleasure to welcome today's guest panelists. We've got Danelle de Toy from South Africa, Titsi Motendi from Zimbabwe, and Aziri Agbayi from Nigeria. We'll start with Danelle. Danelle's no stranger to PwC. She was a guest speaker at our Africa Family Business Conference last year and a friend of the firm. Danelle de Firm. Now describes herself as a wife to one husband, a mother of two kids, a manager of three businesses sister to four siblings, director on five boards, worked on six continents. Danelle is the managing director of Dekir Group, which is a family-owned agricultural business that produces, packs, and markets fresh fruit and vegetables. After she lived and worked overseas for 12 years and spent an 18-month stint in Johannesburg, she joined her family business in the beautiful Ceres Valley in 2013. Her dad and uncle retired shortly afterwards, and this provided her with the opportunity to lead the business for the next generation. She is passionate about her family and believes that a family business will only thrive when there is family cohesion, including that all future generations' expectations align with the current generation's vision for the company. She is a firm believer that we are nothing but custodians for the next generation, just as our ancestors were custodians for what is now our legacy. Welcome, Danelle. Our second guest hails from, hails from Zimbabwe. Titsi is a well-versed, award-winning businesswoman with over 12 years' experience building her own successful businesses. Titsi is recognized globally for her business acumen and world-class delivery. She is an alumna of the Fortune US State Department Global Women's Mentoring Program, member of the African Leadership Net Network, owns and runs a Montessori Primary School, is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Edgar's Club magazine. Her academic background lies in strategic business and brand management. She is currently committed to working with African family businesses to see them transition from generational wealth to generational legacies. To that end, she has co-founded African Family Firms, a family business association aimed at helping African family businesses and next generations to become a part of the projected 59 trillion US dollar global wealth transfer. Most importantly, Titi is wife and mom to three cherished children who have given her more motivation to leave an impactful legacy. Welcome, Titi. Finally, we welcome Aziri, PwC partner from Nigeria. Aziri heads up the international tax and private wealth client services teams in Nigeria. She is also the upskilling territory lead where she drives the purpose-led New World New Skills Initiative, which seeks to help clients and their workforce of the future. Aziri mentors, writes articles, and regularly speaks at conferences. Apart from being a successful career woman, she is also a wife and a mother. Welcome, Aziri. I'll now hand over to Andrea, who'll take us through the program. Thank you. 
Thanks again, ladies, for joining us. And um, we are very privileged uh, that you will share some of your insights. So just quickly looking at the polls, um, let me know if you can see the results. So I can see um, people are saying that they're actually enjoying being um, working and working from home. Uh, some of the others said um, the base aspect is having great efficiencies. So this is not having so many people walk in and chat to you um, throughout the day. And then what the worst aspect is, um, is part lack of exercise and the other one not seeing my friends. Um, so that is just a bit of fun and we'll be running these polls um, throughout the session. Uh, just as Jenny also mentioned, please feel free to ask questions throughout. You don't have to wait to, for a certain um, period of time. We will gladly uh, give those questions to the panels. So ladies, if we start, um, we start with Danelle. Uh, what will you say from your career journey? Um, what's been your greatest achievement and what's been your greatest challenge? Um, uh, thank you, first of all, um, Andrea and Jenny, for the invite to be here today. As I'm really looking forward to sharing some perspective with you. Um, from a, the greatest challenges is definitely coming back to South Africa after I've spent uh, 12 years overseas. Um, I lived and worked in Sydney, Australia, um, in New York, in Switzerland, in Russia. So all over the place. And we came back to Johannesburg um, in 2011. And I got approached by my family to come and live in Sirius. So, so that was quite a challenge coming from all the different cities and, and settling in the country. But I'm loving it. Um, so I think the adjustment from a complete corporate world back into a family business uh, was, was a really great challenge. But with that, it, it also brought some perspective into the family business of how we can actually become more corporate so that we're not just a family business and um, running it as a family business, but actually running it as a corporate business and getting the advantages of running it as a corporate business. Um, so, so definitely the, the challenge adjusting back into a family business and from an achievement perspective, I think definitely taking the business from a pure family run business to a family, uh, a corporate family managed business. Thank you for that, Danelle. And um, Titi, same to you. Can you just repeat the question for me again, Andrea? Yes, uh, just what's been one of your greatest achievements uh, on your journey becoming a a strong and successful businesswoman um, and one of your greatest challenges? Um, I would say one of um, the most, the biggest success I've had is um, I grew up with a multi, I had a multi city upbringing. So I lived in the UK for a while, for eight years of my younger life. And then I moved back to Zimbabwe. And when you moved back to Zimbabwe, you moved into a tiny little town um, called Mashingo that's in the south of the country. And while I was there, I guess I was going into high school, very impressionable, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I had also a lot of pressure from the community and the social upbringing I had where getting an education, getting a job, and the getting married was probably the part that most girls would follow. And yet I was very headstrong and wanted to go into business because I'd seen my mom go into business and I, I aspired to be a businesswoman. So being able to move from Mashingo at some point, moving to Johannesburg and then to New York, then coming back home, setting up my own businesses, the whole journey itself for me was a journey of overcoming the thought processes that I'd been grown up seeing and believing and also to show little girls from where I came from that anything is possible if you know what it is that you want to do and if you just go out there and don't just dream it make it happen and I think that's one of the biggest achievements that I've had and I keep on pushing myself knowing that I was once a little girl who really didn't know what she wanted to do but went out there and just dreamt big and went for it one of the biggest challenges is being a woman in the business space, especially in the African business space. It's always taken for granted that men know better, men are smarter, men are more experienced. 
So when you go in and you pitch for anything or you're presenting yourself, you know, there's always that prejudice that lies there, but you have to go in there anyway. And you have to put your best foot forward and just be, know who you are, what you want to do and how you want to do it. But it's not always easy when you walk out of rooms and people are laughing at you and they think, who do you think you are? But you have to just keep on going at it. So I think one of the biggest challenging ja- challenges has just to be the prejudice that women face when we have to go into um, the business spaces, especially as entrepreneurs. I presume you've built a bit of resilience over the years. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Titi. And is Yuri, from your perspective, uh, the um, greatest achievement and challenge? Yeah, I, I think um, my achievement really has been around PwC. And in fact, that's also brought my greatest um, challenges. Um, and I think um, um, I appreciate the fact that um, moving cities can be difficult. And that kind of aligns with what Danielle had said, and even Sissy. Um, when I moved back from New York, it was a huge challenge for me in many ways. One, the change in work environment, the change in just my social environment as well. And in the same year is when I became partner. And so at the time I had to deal with, you know, managing or working with a different team, different style of working that was really challenging. And sometimes I would even leave the office crying. Yet on the outside, you know, it was admirable what position I'd achieved. I was the first female partner in tax, you know, and everyone pretty much celebrated what I'd achieved. But, you know, going back home, it was always one um, breakdown or another. That was a huge challenge for me until I got into that space of, you know, identifying a coach that worked with me for a while and then continued to always stay in touch with my mentors. That helped me significant. <clears throat> That's wonderful. So um, I'm going to move on to the next question, um, which actually fits in quite well. So um, with being one of your, um, some of your role models or people that influenced you. Um, so Aziri, you can go straight into that and then I'll move on to Danelle. Yeah, so the role model, I mean, there's so many in Nigeria. I think Nigeria is blessed with a lot of female entrepreneurs and women associations. So what I did was leaned into those associations, one of them being Wimpies, um, and looked towards, you know, the founders of those associations to be my um, role models. Um, And one specifically to be my mentor. Um, She happens to be a very senior person in the banking industry. Um, and I don't know if I have to call her name here, but also one of the leading women in Nigeria. And the good story from that is, um, I was also then nominated or awarded one of the leading women in Nigeria. I don't know if it was because I was associated with her, but I get the vibe that you know your success is dependent on the average of successful people you have around you. And to the extent you surround yourselves with weak people, that would be your story. So maybe that's what rubbed off also on me getting a similar award. Do I have to call her name? Um, you can say if you want to. If you don't want to, <laughs> don't have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aziz. So I'll give her that credit. She's my mentor. <laughs> I, I have several of them as well um, in Nigeria. Yeah. Wonderful. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I always say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And that's exactly in, in business as well. Who you, who's, who you look up to, um, which podcast do you listen to, which books do you read? Um, so thanks for sharing, Aziri. Um, and Danielle, for you? Well, I'm very lucky that I come from a family with extremely strong female role models. So from my grandmothers, my, my own mother, her sisters, my sisters, my, my cousins, they, they all excel in their different um, professions. But it's been interesting, as Titi was talking earlier about her mum inspiring her to want to go into business. 
I actually started thinking about my own upbringing and my my mum's youngest sister. Um, when when I was a little girl, she seriously just pushed the boundaries. It was the early 1980s in South Africa, and as you all know, during the apartheid years. And she went and she traveled Africa completely all by by herself um, as a white white young woman backpacking through Africa. And I think it was unheard of in those times. And as I grew up, I actually just realized that you can do anything you want to do. And, it's, it's, and she went on and she ran the comrades and she went to work in Israel on the kibbutz and she ended up marrying an Englishman. So, and that, that all happened in the 1980s. And I think that actually left a really big impression on me as, as a little girl to go, you know what? We can do anything we want to do. You know, we don't need to stand back. Um, yeah, so definitely that that that's been one of my big role models. And I think as you as you grow up and and as you work in business as well, you it changes who your role model is. And if I look at the current leaders of the world, you know, the Angela Merkel's, the Jacinda Ardern's from New Zealand, I think we can all look up to them and see what they achieve. You know. As, as a woman, you do not need to stand back. We can lead. 100% agree. Thanks for that. Um, and Titi, from your perspective? Um, just listening to Danelle speak, um, brought back to family, I guess. Um, my mom has been um, a consistent role model for me. It, we've had a lot of differences of uh, opinions in a lot of things, but she's always been that um, person who's consistently broken the boundaries herself. And just seeing her do it and living with her while she was doing it was an experience for me. I remember um, at some point where she had to be a single mom because they were living apart from my dad. And she was trying to juggle having to attend school events while running her business, um, while also living life. And I think that in itself showed me that anything is possible and you just have to have a good support system. And my grandmother, in her time, she gave so many strong value systems that resonate through me. I see them through all the female members of, of my family. And as I have grown, I've had different women who have come into my life. I remember one very important woman was a lady who taught me when I just came back from the UK and was transitioning into the Zimbabwean school system. And I remember her and I always honor her when I get the opportunity. She's late now. But I remember when I was struggling to do um, this transition and I was very really headstrong even at a young age. Um, and <laughs> I came to um, loggerheads with a teacher as well as the head teacher because um, I, was, I was supposed to be put in one class. I refused and I said I wanted to go into her class. And so it came to a, a head where she said, you know what, I'm going to take her into my class whether you, um, you approve of it or not because I understand her and I know her well and I know she's going to do very well. And I remember just the fact that she fought for me and she believed in me and she put down every aspect that was thrown at me in terms of when you're a girl, you're headstrong and you're stubborn. And she said, no, she just wants to learn. You have to give her the opportunity to learn and you have to give her the support. And I think that has stayed with me for the longest time with how I interact with people and with when I think about when I want to do something. Because I know that there's somebody out there that believes in you and that somebody out there who's really waiting on you to succeed so that they can get permission to do it themselves. And so there's so many women who out there, they are doing their best just to make that dent for other women, just to give us an example of that it can be done. And like what Danelle said, when you watch them doing and watch, when you watch them flying, you realize that it's possible. We can actually go there. We can actually do that. And so, so many women stand out to me throughout my life. So many women who are unsung heroes, so many women who have done the simplest of things, who have probably never gotten awards for the work that they do, but have 
shown up, shown up every time and shown up consistently. Sure. It sounds like the three of you have really amazing people in your life and it's, it's great to have, um, and it's a privilege to, to be able to have those role models. <clears throat> so if we zone into where we are at the moment, um, in, in this, the story of the spread and the unthinkable human tragedies of uh, COVID-19 is the ultimate case study in high stake um, leadership. I don't think any of us can afford to miss the lessons learned during this time. So all leaders can learn from what we have seen women do in the crisis, especially if you look at what Jacinda Ardern has accomplished in dealing with the pandemic in New Zealand. And then in a recent study, it showed that in the face of risk, women are more likely to make data-driven, sure bad decisions, as opposed to risky ones where the downsides are big and the results are unknown. So this has proven to be invaluable during this time. Um, another study, a McKinsey study, has shown that women are indeed more focused on building communities and teams. And um, the study pinpointed the essential characteristics of leadership and set out to determine the tendencies of men and women under normal stock um, circumstances and then in time of crisis. And then in the one finding, um, it showed that women are indeed more people orientated and spend more time developing and coaching other leaders in organizations. And anyone in a position to rethink the majority male C-suite boardrooms in their organization should hence reflect. Um, we think of gender diversity as being about representation, but COVID-19 shows us that it's about high quality, life-saving leadership. Um, so Danelle, if we, we start with you, how has COVID impacted you and your family, um, you know, managing work and, and how are you personally coping with all of these? Um, I think we, we, we as a company are in a very fortunate position. Um, obviously in South Africa, we went into a hard lockdown on the 26th of March. But being in the food industry, we actually have just continued business as usual with a couple of additional regulations and obviously additional measures in the business. But that did put a lot more strain on the working from home. All of a sudden, being a, a teacher for my two kids that's in grade two and three, and I just want to applaud the teachers out there because I've realized I'm definitely not one. Um, but it definitely put a lot of strain on that because although we, we put um, measures in place so that you can work from home, um, at the same time at work, it actually required me to be way more present at work and work way more longer hours than normal because we had to continue with the business and we had to implement all of a sudden all of these COVID regulations and at the same time, you have a workforce of 1,500 people and you're responsible for their, for their safety and for their health at work. So it was a huge responsibility. So definitely the first three weeks was, the first three weeks was extremely hard um, uh, personally and I think on my family as well. Um, from a work perspective, I, I actually think the new way of working, if I can call it the new way of working, is doing us all well. I think we found a new balance between what is important in life. And, and, and that's a good thing from that came out of the COVID crisis. So I think people start focusing on what's really necessary to do and what the important things in life is. And also realizing that your family life is is as important as your work life and, uh, and the one shouldn't take precedent over the other one. Yeah, so it's been challenging, but um, we, we threw it and I, and I think from a South Africa perspective, as we easing out of lockdown, um, that, that the challenges is actually going to remain. It's not, it's not like the virus is disappearing. So, so those challenges in the workplace remain. And I think that as a leader, one of our most important jobs in this time is, is to really um, give people the, the confidence that, that you are doing the best for them. Um, from a health perspective and just to calm the fears because there's lots of fear out there and there's lots of fear mongering out there and I think it's that constant communication to ensure that you can provide your workforce with the relevant information and with the right information. Thanks for that, Danielle. 
Um, and from your perspective, uh, Titi? So when we went into lockdown, Zimbabwe went into a lockdown at, at the end of March, I think a week after South Africa. And our lockdown wasn't as stringent as South Africa, but it was quite um, a wake up call because I think for the longest time, there was a lot of denial on the ground and not really, it was not our problem until it became a global problem. And so owning a school, we were two weeks away from the actual closing of schools and we were forced to close earlier. We had a lot of parents who were panicking, the teachers were panicking and being um, the leader of the business as well, it was one of those, you couldn't really answer questions and you weren't ready to, to answer questions without facts on the ground. And so I think initially the first week, there was a lot of panic even uh, within myself. I usually like to believe that I'm cool and collected, but at that time I actually was really confused, not sure what type of support to offer people and what answers to give them. And it took, I think, a couple of days before I came into um, to grasp with everything. And we started um, moving things into a more realistic perspective of, okay, this might be a while. And that means our family was going to be indoors for a while. Um, students were not going to be able to attend physical school for a while and it means in terms of our business really looking at what our business is and what services we provide and how we could keep everyone at work as well as ensure that our bills were paid and i think as a business owner those are the things that really strike you when you're told you're shutting down business and there's no plan around how you're going to open up again so as a family um I think for my kids, we're looking forward to the holiday. That was, I think that was a saving grace because we're going into the holiday. They were already expecting long days at home. So it wasn't really a shock to them to be at home because they figured, well, school is closed, we're on holiday. So we're playing outside and well, we're on holiday. It's when it became a bit too long for them and we had to go back to school. We had to then um, start looking at us as a school. How could we support the parents? How could we support the teachers? And how could we support the students? And now it's been two months into schools opening and we've managed to transition very well. The students are resilient. I'll tell you that the little kids are very resilient. They've managed to adapt to online learning. We've managed to achieve more during the time we've been on lockdown than we have in physical lessons, uh, surprisingly and the parents have a new appreciation to for teachers i have a new appreciation for teachers because i have three kids as well who also have to attend those lessons and i think the overall experience for covid 19 has been one of what i always say to the students there's sometimes where you get put in time out and you just have to reflect and I think the whole world was put on timeout and we just had to reflect and rethink and re-strategize and just get back on to the road. But then you know that is it's a new road and it's got its own challenges and we just have to do the best we can. Well, definitely opportunities arising and obviously the start being Quite a, a quite a bit of a challenge. Um, and Aziri, from your perspective? Um, I think from my end, it was um, a time to rebalance. Um, and I struggled through the first few weeks when um, we went on lockdown as well. Nigeria went on lockdown on the 27th of March. Um, and in that week, you know, there was a lot of things I had to grapple with first. My partner was out of the country. I just, I have a baby who's nine months today. So she's pretty much really young. And at the time I was very much reliant on her crutch. So when I go to the office, I drop her the crutch and then we come back home together. 
So the crutches were closed. There was no one to support. My mom stays out of the city. So I was like, how do I bridge that gap? You know, go back to where she is, stay with her, and then have her also take care of the baby with me. But then the challenge with that would have been access to the internet. So we have huge problems with internet connectivity in Nigeria. And I was just like thinking, how many data bundles do I have to get to just make sure I'm connected online, I'm able to dive into calls. And then we all know there were so many webinars going on. It was like webinar fatigue. And mm -hmm. you had to speak on so many of them. You had to be on calls in the office. You had to address your workforce, your staff. You know, everyone was looking to you for answers. And as a consultant, it's not just your staff, it's also your clients. You want, you want to put your clients in a state of, you know, no fear. You're able to also address their questions or able to even connect with the government authorities to begin to engage them and suggest solutions to them. So this was all just going through my mind. It was crazy to take the list. Um, I then had to move to my mom's, but then once every open, the internet would go down, I wouldn't be able to get back on a call. It was difficult, but we found a way around it because I had to then move my mom to me um, in the city. And then, you know, I was able to manage some of that but it didn't come without strain. Um, but I think the good thing was just the ability to bond with my daughter still during the period. And that also was a distraction because sometimes she'd be crying on the background while I'm on a call, you know. But so far, um, I think I'm balanced out now. Um, it looks all good. It, I, I'm enjoying, perfectly enjoying this um, way of working. Um, Though I would say that during the period it was happening, I didn't feel there was a division or a distinction between work and um, my life. Everything just kind of morphed into one and there was no closing hours. It was like you were walking around the clock. But I think I've gotten a hang of that now and I'm settling into the new normal, if I would use that word. <laughs> As your partner um, returned since, or are you still <laughs> managing this new normal? <laughs> I am. I am. I am. I think my teams, we've restructured, you know, we've gotten around new ways to communicating with each other and just getting things done, but also staying in touch with clients and staying in touch with what's going on outside as well, because definitely we need to be on top of our game, you know, if, we are, if, if we're going to service or provide the best service or quality service to our clients. I think one of our leaders uh, shared, shared with us in the last week that uh, one of his clients had said to him, he, he's forgotten whether he's working from home or sleeping at work. And <laughs> a lot of us are finding Honestly. ourselves in, in those situations yeah. and it's important to put yes. boundaries on in place because, um, you know, we do we do have work and we do have home. And if we can still um, close the door and and stick to office hours, um, it will help with our personal well-being as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to open the second poll now, so I'm um, going to stay open for five minutes, so feel free uh, to complete it. So uh, the next question, um, before I go into some of the questions asked by the audience, um, are there any social stigmas or trust issues that, that you've experienced, especially as mothers um, with children, uh, around maybe being not being able to multitask effectively? both from a personal and from other women in business perspective. Um, Danielle, if we start with you. I think um, Titi said it very well in the beginning. There's definitely a prejudice against women in business. Forget about mothers in business for the time being, but women in business. Um, and, and, and I think, I don't think it's going to get resolved in in my lifetime. So it is just the way that our communities and the world has been set up by men in the past. Um, and then from a mother, I think at the, the Africa conference, the family business conference, I, I, I also said to the audience, I said, uh, can the mothers in the room put up their hands of how many times that they've been asked, how can they manage uh, a career as well being a mother 
and almost everyone will put up their hand and you'll ask the exact same question to the fathers going how many of you of you have ever been asked how do you manage being a father as well as having a career and none of them have ever been asked that question because at the end of the day the assumption is is that the mother is the carer of the kids and um, I think from my perspective is that that I don't shy away from that, you know, as, as in my in, in, in my home, my husband traveled a lot, or travels a lot, but traveled a lot. Um, fortunately, during COVID, he was so. Um, so he traveled uh, a lot and it meant that most of the, the parenting comes down to me. And I think it's just to be present, as, as Jenny said, being present at work, but being present at home when you're home and being able to, to have that shutdown between the two. You know, I don't believe that people can have a home personality and a work personality. You know, I think that the way you are at work is how you're at home and vice versa. But I definitely think as, as women, we need to set the boundaries to say, you know, when I'm deciding to spend time with my kids, I'm spending time with them and work and wait. You know, there's nothing that important that can't wait. And I, and I think that's quite important for yourself to, to set those, those boundaries. But definitely in the workplace, there's always um, the prejudice against mothers that's working and there's always the, the people that believe that they don't work as hard as someone that don't have kids and I think as leaders and as female leaders it's it's our job to empower that woman and to tell them you know what it is fine to be a mother and to work there's nothing wrong with that you know and you can do the job as good as anyone else that don't have kids being that male or female. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, at Titi, what have you experienced? So my story is quite an interesting one. Before having kids, um, I had um, it in my mind that I definitely want to be an entrepreneur and I want to be able to work in a space where I can bring my kids along. Because I think I was very aware of the fact that when the kids hit the teenagers, they don't want to be with you. They want to be everywhere else but with you. So since my first child, um, and this is eight years later, I've had the strong headedness of being able to take my children with me everywhere and work with them. So I am that client or that service provider that will be pregnant and come to work to the office and to come to meetings. And equally so, um, two weeks after postpartum, I will still be in that meeting, but with baby in tow. Because, well, you saw me pregnant, it makes sense that you'd see a baby to go with it. And so it, it always made for interesting conversations sometimes when people are like, you brought a baby? And I'd be like, well, there was no way that I was going to leave the baby. And especially because um, I've got... I've got this traditionalist side to me, which always says the first three months of my children, I have to be their primary caregiver. So during those three months, literally we are stuck together. And so those meetings were interesting. I'd go with baby, excuse myself if I needed to feed baby or change baby. And all three of them have known me to be with them for most of their lives and to be around me most of their lives. They're the ones who, who have the little backpack and say, are we going for a meeting? And be like, yes, you are. And we go together. It's For the men, it's been a shock to see a baby in the room or to see a pregnant woman who's just had a baby because most of my babies are C-section babies and they're like, you just had a C-section. And I'd be like, yes. But if I didn't make it for this meeting, you would have excused the fact that I'm a woman and you'd have come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful stories. So I am here. Yeah, and I'm here with the baby. And I didn't find it um, difficult. I think they probably found it more difficult because they're trying to figure out why. But for me, it came naturally. I was like, you know what? I, I can't change my sex. I can't ch change my gender. And I can't change the fact that I'm a mother and I choose to be a mother and I choose to be with my children. 
Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm quite daring. I actually haven't been in a meeting where somebody brought their baby along. But I saw that photo of Jacinda Ardern as, as well in a, a minister's meeting where she also, had, her baby was sitting on her lap. Um, yes, thanks so much for sharing. Anna Ziri, from your perspective. Um, so could you take the question again, please? Um, just around the social stigmas um, and trust issues that you've experienced, especially as a as a mother, and being able to multitask effectively. Um, so I've not really experienced it, perhaps because um, I only started having my kid, you know, when I was rather senior in um, PwC, um, and I think to a very large extent, you know, PwC tends to uh, manage such expectations for women, but then there's still certain areas or instances where we've, you know, found that there's some stigma or bias against um, nursing mothers. And perhaps that has to do with, you know, when they're out on maternity leave, you know, how do we appraise people who've gone out for so long when they're, you know, when they're out of the office and when they're back, you know, that stigma of, oh, you're not performing as you should because you went to give birth tends to come up on the wrong way. Um, and so it's just the language as well. How do we communicate with our female employees just so we don't come off as being um, unfeeling leaders? And I think to a very large extent as well, ensuring that you know the crop of leaders that we're breeding are very diverse will help to address that. And so when we're having those discussions on, um, during appraisal, the mere fact that there's one woman in the room helps to bring that kind of balance and helps to you know, cut down any of those unfeeling statements. So um, I've been very involved in discussions like that as well um, and to try and bring some sense in the room because it's not because the male leaders don't think um you know are, are unkind or it's just they they haven't thought of it and they don't have the capacity to think of it that way because they're not female um so i think it's introducing that subject in such a way that it's easy for them to understand from your perspective and not in an aggressive manner but in an eye-opening manner to say no look at it from this perspective this is how it feels this is how it sounds like and this is how it comes across and together i think it's then possible to kind of address those um, stigmas that are created. But I think it will be a very long journey because um, to a very large extent, outside of PwC, there's a wider environment, there's a wider community that kind of enforces or reinforces that stigma. And once you just go out of the office, you know, you're hit with a whirlwind of some of those. It's pretty much like, oh, has she made it to this level? Has she been able to acquire so much wealth? She probably done it with the support of a man, or she couldn't even have done it without having a man on her side. You know, that usually comes up across as women don't are not intelligent. You know, you're not smart enough to do it. You hardly would hear that for a successful male leader. And even when it's said for a male leader, it's almost like behind every successful man there is a there is a woman. It's almost like the woman is a crutch and not the principal person or an equal partner to contribute into that progress. So it would take a very long time for us, I think, to bridge that gap, because I think we need to deal with it with the wider community and not just in our smaller offices. Sure, thanks for sharing. And um, I've also seen in the, in the workplace uh, that sometimes that women feel like they have to act like males uh to be listened to or to be heard and um yeah just the challenge that we should just be ourselves still act with empathy still support each other um yeah just be females and, and still leading um i'm just gonna share the, the poll results um so we've seen for the moms out there uh should they say they do more <laughs> like we've heard and then um, the other question was, you see your business emerging stronger? And uh, it was also a yes, which is very positive. 
Um, so I'm going to move over to some of the questions that we've been receiving uh, from, from the audience. Um, so the one question, um, Danelle, I'm maybe going to start with you. So, and then with Titi. So as your journey as an entrepreneur, as a businesswoman, how have you managed to bypass the misogyny and or the appropriateness, um, maybe sexually faced, so that you could be heard and also make deals? <laughs> That's quite a... A, a interesting question. I think most people on this webinar at some some stage would have been faced with challenges like that. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes as females, and 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 I'm a I'm a feminist, so so I will always fight for female rights. And and I've got a daughter, and I obviously want her to to grow up in a more equal world than than what I grew up in. Um, you know, when, when I start my journey at our family business, being in agriculture, in our region, there were no females leading any of these businesses. So I know even not only myself um, got ridiculed, but even my, my dad and my uncle got ridiculed for, for employing me as the MD. You know, how can you expect a woman to, to run a, a family business and that being an agricultural business as well? But I think that the easiest way to manage that is people expect you to, um, to react to it. And actually the easiest way to, to get past this is not to react to it. And it's actually just to, to show them that you can do something, that you don't have to, to do certain things like males do to get a deal done. You can actually get a deal done by, by just being yourself. And I think that theme has come through quite strong today as well. Is I think as females, we should stop trying to be like males. We should just be ourselves. We should be um, the best female leader that we can be. And, and I think that, that was for me throughout my career. I've been in uncom uncomfortable situations, you know, again, I think every one of us, and I, I used to be in the IT industry, which is obviously massively male dominant. Um, and the amount of times that people, you'll be the only female around the table and the expectation will be that you will go and make the coffee or you will go and make the tea because you're female, you know, and it's just to go, sorry guys, I done it last week, someone else else's turn. So, I think it's to be bold and to be brave out there at the end of the day. Sure. Very inspiring. And uh, Siti, from, from your perspective? Um, firstly, I agree with everything that Donnell said. It's difficult being a woman in business, but you have to find your own voice and be clear about what your voice is. There's times where you can feel the pressure to want to react because someone has really pushed you over the edge by a comment or sometimes it's just um, backhanded comments that you get. Um, I remember when I, I started a publishing company that was one of my most successful businesses and I remember I used to go and do all the marketing trying to get advertising and so forth and there was one particular incident where I had a meeting with somebody who then postponed it. And then this gentleman called me and asked me, um, when can we reschedule? And I said to him, you know, let me just check um, that our reschedule meeting is not clashing with uh, a doctor's appointment I had. And so he asked, what is this doctor's appointment? And I'm like, I need to go see the guy near because I was expecting. And then the backhanded comment I got was, well, well, then get hold of me after you've had your child. And I was like, okay, I, needless to say, I never got hold of that gentleman ever again. And I, I, I felt like, okay, this is a comment he wouldn't have passed on to another man. And also his intentions were never to support my business, but he had other intentions. And as women, you need to be able to be clear about the people you deal with and understand whether they want to support your business or they're just giving you the runaround and go in there with the confidence that you can deliver on the work that you have to do. Go in there with the confidence that you, you're knowledgeable and that you're successful. 
don't take the back seat or go in there and be treated as a PA or as um, the coffee maker or as the nanny or all the other things that usually befall women. Just stand your ground. Know that you're knowledgeable, you're competent, and you're in that room because you're knowledgeable and that you're competent. Sure. Thanks, Titi, for sharing. Um, then another question I'm going to um, do a Ziri. So when finding mentors, did you seek them based on their technical expertise or um, their success, so irrespective of the industry? Um, so, so I've used um, both um, technical competency and success as well. And that's been agnostic to industries. Um, I think for the first part, I look to also their confidence um, and charisma. Um, so I like charismatic leaders. I like leaders who are very confident. I like leaders who are very clear and spoken. And of course, I then look to how successful they've been in their businesses. So all the mentors that I picked are really successful women. And I'm very biased to women as well because I think they would understand me better. <laughs> I think I'd be able to open up and um, share you know, more personal um, feelings with them than I would a man. I actually did try, you know, um, picking a male mentor before now, in fact, a male coach, but it was kind of difficult, you know, just getting him to understand um, um, what specific times I wanted to have a call or, you know, that I'd love to have a call, you know, maybe right after work because I'd gone through the day already you know, and um, I needed some time for my kid, you know, and could he just even have the call maybe late in the night? I couldn't call him at those times of the night because, you know, it would then just look like I was also getting into his personal space with his own partner or wife. And whereas if I called a woman, on the other hand, it didn't come across that way. So I think there's a lot more flexibility with a female mentor or coach and there is with a male or someone in the same sex. So I definitely do look to females. Um, but then again, that's not to say it's a rule. Um, that's just my preference. Okay. Um, thanks, Aziri. And then the last question I'm gonna ask um, to the panel is just what can we do to help and support fellow women, maybe in vulnerable groups, um, including expectant mothers who, um, whose jobs are at risk now due to the downturn and due to COVID. Danielle, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I think in, in businesses, um, we've come a long way in accommodating um, working parents, and I don't want to, to keep this just to females. I think it's, it's for me, it's important to, to acknowledge both parents in this. And, um, especially in our business, we've, where, where possible, we've implemented flexi time, we've implemented um, paid maternity leave at certain um, job levels to get people to come back to work. Um, and it's just to have empathy, you know, and especially uh, as a mother myself, is, is um, to know when people really need to have that time out and to spend some time with their kids. Hi, Andrea. Yes. Yes, I think, I think we lost her for a moment there. <laughs> yes, oh, okay. I think we did. <laughs> Have we lost you? No, you're back. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's just to, 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 uh, just to manage and to lead with empathy at the end of the day for me. Thanks, Danelle. Um, and Titi, from your perspective? 
Um, I'm just going to add on to what Danal said, uh, because I, I truly believe empathy is key, especially during these difficult times. Mm. Um, prior to COVID, and I think my stance has always been the same, because um, I have a lot of the parents, a lot of teachers that we employ at our school are parents. And because of that, you have those who go on maternity leave and they're not sure whether it's going to be paid or unpaid. We always make sure that it's paid maternity leave. And I think because of things like that, we've had them already doing online learning because I remember one of my teachers went on maternity leave two years ago and she was, she said, okay, I appreciate the support I've been getting from the school. I would like to still continue my lessons if I can do them via Skype or Zoom. So it's things like that. And also when um, the teachers can't leave their children at home because there's no one to help them with them and they're still very young to come to school, we allow them to bring them through and have them as part of the, as, as part of the community. And I think it's having those type of policies where possible in businesses where we understand that sometimes with parents, whether it's um, a mother or a father, and they need time off to sort out family issues, especially those issues that are pertaining to young children, or they need to be able to bring their children in um, or have shortened work days because they need to go back to their children. Um, it's having that type of empathy to realize that we're all humans and we are all affected by things sometimes unwarranted sometimes unknowingly it just happens to us and it's, it's when we are leaders in such situations it's how we handle ourselves and we extend that empathy and know that one day it could be us and these individuals will also step up to the plate to support us that we truly then become the leaders that are like Jacinda mm. Mm. Just going to open the last poll um and then aziri from your perspective um so I, I like to just um maybe summarize that as um, a case of mind over matter um so that um you should as much as possible continue to remain in control of the situation um and i think that would really help in scaling through some of you know the fear that this has brought on us. Um, empathy definitely continues to be very important. Um, but I think uh, a number of strategies definitely required to sail through, including engaging, you know, engaging continuous engagement with your people, continuous engagement as a leader, you know, and engagement with your, you know, your, your staff, just to hear from their side as well and be able to also um, give back. Um, I like to use a 3C model um, for this period, and I think that has continued to work, especially for businesses who will be sitting through, and pretty much around care, um, because that has been um, called to question for the most part this period, um, cash to ensure liquidity during the business, and again, that speaks to mind over matter, because at the end of the day, businesses still need to run. And then just continuity, you know, ability to just be able to continue despite some of the uncertainties that we're seeing. It's just what strategies have been um, put in place. Um, so I, I think those would be the additional thoughts I've contributed. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Um, can't believe the hour already passed. <laughs> it goes by so quickly. And I actually have so many other questions. And I um, feel like we can sit here all day, maybe with a glass of wine as well. But, um, so just what, what, if I can summarize what I'm taking out of this, is just surrounding yourself or having strong role models, um, people you look up to, people that you can learn from, um, being yourself, that's so important. Just being yourself and not feeling like you have to be someone else and then finding your own voice, whatever that might be, and having confidence and, and being courageous and brave um, and believing in yourself. So thank you so much and I uh, really appreciate it. And for those on the call, thank you for joining. And if you can maybe just complete the, the poll, the final poll, um, 
And as I said, we recorded it. So if somebody would like to take these gems and golden nuggets um, and re-listen to it, just pop me an email. Thank you so much and have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Bye-bye. Thank you.